Welcome to the How to Program with Java podcast, where all you need is the desire to learn and you too can become a Java programmer with absolutely no knowledge of programming. And now, your host, Trevor Page. Hey, what's going on, guys? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session of the How to Program with Java podcast. We have hit episode number five zero. We are half a century in to the How to Program with Java podcast, and that's fantastic. Uh, I guess I can't wait until episode 100. I guess that's going to be my next real big milestone. Uh, so yeah, thanks for joining. Thanks for listening to all these episodes. Uh, what's funny is today I actually went back in my archives. I was doing a bunch of research for today's episode, and I went back in the archives, and I actually listened to episode number one, believe it or not, because I got a little bit curious. I wanted to see um, what uh, what that actually sounded like. I was checking my stats and whatnot on downloads and all those vanity metrics and all those things. And um, I saw that the episode number one is, has been downloaded the most, which I guess makes sense. Everyone wants to start from the beginning. And it's been downloaded over 10,000 times which uh, which is incredible to me, obviously. One episode being downloaded by 10,000 different people um, that could fill almost an entire stadium. A small stadium, but uh, a stadium nonetheless. And uh, and it's horrible. I was listening to it, and um, I guess, you know, I was a little bit timid when I first started these things, and uh, I, can, I can really tell that I've come a long way in becoming more comfortable in front of the microphone and becoming more personable, and, uh, and really just hopefully becoming more approachable. So uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed that at all in the progression. If you've been listening since the first episode way back in, the, in 2012, I believe it was late 2012, the progression you've heard has probably been gradual. But if you sort of motored through all of these, you probably can remember back to that first episode and, uh, and how, well, not so great I was back then. But in any case, you've stuck to it and you've, uh, you've held the ground and you've come this far. So I uh, commend you for that, good sir or madam. So uh, in today's episode, I think I'm just going to sort of dive right into it. I, I actually, I spent way longer uh, than I normally uh, do in, in preparation for this particular episode uh, because I wanted to make sure that I was delivering to you guys the absolute best stuff that I can deliver to you. And, and that is, um, I don't know if I take, I, I guess I can say I take pride in that kind of dedication. Um, so having said that, I've sort of, you know, I'm recording this. Normally I record around noon, just to give you guys a bit of an insider scoop into how I do things. I generally do my research, you know, I wake up in the morning, I have my breakfast, I do whatever it is my morning routine is, have the shower, brush the teeth, get all that stuff ready. And, um, and then I sit down in my office, usually around 9.30, and I start researching. So I do my research from 9.30 till about 11 or 12, and then I start recording. So today, however, it is currently 8.15 p.m., okay? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective. I've, I've spent probably the better half of an entire day, past the better half of an entire day, you know, what is that? That's more, that's a longer than a normal work day, uh, just doing preparation and research and, uh, and playing around with things and downloading new software and all that kind of stuff just to make sure that everything I'm going to say today uh, I can say with utmost confidence of it being correct and, uh, and being able to really translate it into um, uh, from a, an experiential standpoint to translate it into something that you guys will actually understand because that's another thing I pride myself on is being able to teach uh, something, take a complex um, you know, methodology or a complex task or, or complex whatever and turn it into something that is bite-sized and that is understandable in plain English. So, having rambled about that, what I'm getting at here with this little speech is that I didn't do any of my normal preparations in terms of looking at uh, five-star reviews or, uh, you know, listener questions or any of that kind of stuff. So if you left a five-star review in the past week or two and you have not yet heard it on one of the latest episodes, I apologize. I will be getting to it next week because hopefully I will have done a whole bunch of research and I will be much more on the ball for next week's episode. Um, so if, you, uh, if you've left it, then you know hold, hold on uh, tight because next week you'll be hearing that uh, review. And hey, if you haven't left a review yet, by all means, I would love for you to go to howtoprogramwithjava.com forward slash love, L-O-V-E, 
uh, share the love, spread the word, uh, leave a rating and review. Any five-star rating reviews that are left, I will read uh, out loud at the top of the next episode. If you've heard many, many of these episodes and you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've heard many, many of these episodes and you haven't le- yet left a review, what the heck are you waiting for? Um, that's, uh, that's you know, really would help me out in terms of getting the word out for this podcast. Anyway. I'm sure you've heard that all before many, many times. So today is going to be a cool transition. Let's transition into the the, the actual learning material, the, the feature segment, if you will. I've heard from other podcasts, they call it the feature segment. That's when they get down and dirty with the, the content that they'll be talking about today. So what we're going to be talking about is a transition from the world of SQL and MySQL to be exact, which is what we've been talking about in databases and all that stuff. And we're going to be transitioning into something called a persistence framework. Okay, again, big word, sounds uh, intimidating. Um, and normally I say it's not. This this one is a bit, well, just persistence, a persistence framework in general is actually a bit intimidating. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to take a little bit of the edge off by uh, by actually going through some introduction stuff today. So we're going to be talking about an introduction to persistence frameworks, and we're going to be talking more specifically about an introduction to the Hibernate persistence framework. Okay, so strap on your boots. That's what we're going to be learning about today. Um, so this persistence frameworks in general um, definitely go hand in hand with SQL and databases and things of that sort. So since we've been talking about SQL and databases, I'm going to be continuing the the theme, if you will, uh, by talking about persistence frameworks. So what is a persistence framework? What is this thing that I keep talking about and that I've alluded to in the past episode? Um, persistence frameworks are what allow you to program um, in, in the world of Java a connection to your database. Okay, because in the past we've learned about Java. Okay, we've learned about the Spring framework, which helps to mend the um, the communication between uh, the presentation layer, which is the HTML stuff and the JavaScript stuff, and it helps Spring framework help helps to mend the uh, communication between the HTML stuff and the Java stuff. Okay, so much like that framework, the Spring framework, the Hibernate framework or the persistence framework. Um, Hibernate is just a, another, it's just a specific type of persistence framework. Um, Hibernate uh, allows you to communicate between Java and your database in a nice way, okay, in Java code. So the whole point here, the whole point to all these things is to bring everything back into the land of Java. That is totally a, a concept or a, ter- a terminology that I have made up. I always call things Java land or HTML land or database land. Um, but there are, you know, more professional uh, terminologies for these things. You know, when I call it Java land, it's usually the business layer. When I call the HTML land, it's usually the presentation layer. And when I call it the persistence framework land or the hibernate land, it's usually, or database land, it's usually the, um, the data layer. Okay, so persistence layer, uh, business layer, and data layer. But I like to, you know, always be more uh, human understandable. Is that that's not a good term for that? I like to be, I guess, plain English is how I like to describe things. So I describe it as HTML land, Java land, and database land, and persistence land. So the whole point of all these things is to bring all the lands together to combine them all into a very um, manageable way in such a a way that they become Java friendly. Okay, it all comes back to Java. Java is the core of all of this stuff. Java is the core that we use to create our web applications. And since our web applications exist in the persistence layer and the business layer and the data layer, okay, HTML land, uh, Java land, and uh, database is sort of what not land, uh, because they all exist in different realms, if you will, um, people create these things called frameworks that allow us to become or be able to code things in a more not only uh, familiar way because it's in Java code, but also to to implement design patterns and, and you know best practices and and, and a, a culmination of many 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 decades of programming knowledge and bring them together 
into an hopefully easy to understand and easy to use um, framework that can be plugged into uh, your Java code so that you can use it and you can take advantage of it and make your application lifecycle a lot easier um, in terms of you know time spent and effort and whatnot. So that's the whole point to these things, right? That's why the Spring Framework exists. It exists for you to be able to communicate between Java and HTML in a mostly, uh, you know, friendly way. Um, and and same with Hibernate. Okay, Hibernate is a type of persistence um, framework that allows you to communicate between Java and your database. Okay, by by using Java code. All right. So Hibernate. Again, Hibernate is one of a bunch of different persistence type frameworks. Um, there are, I'm sure, at least a handful out there. Um, there's JPA that you can use. Um, what the heck does JPA stand for? Java um, Persistence uh, JPA Annotations. Oh, God, I, this is terrible. I should know this stuff. Uh, I very frequently specifically use JPA. Um, if I type in JPA, Java Persistence API, okay, API, I, I almost got it correct. Um, so JPA is another type of persistence framework. Um, and I mean, Hibernate uses a lot of J the JPA stuff. I think JPA is um, sort of a a standard, if you will. It's a, it's a standard, well, actually, let me click on it. I'm going to go ahead and click on the uh, the wiki article here. Um, so the, J the Java Persistence API, sometimes referred to as JPA, I would say often referred to as JPA, is a Java programming language application programming interface specification that describes the management of relational data in applications using the Java platform, uh, both standard and enterprise edition. Okay, very, con you know, uh, Wiki tries its best to be straightforward, but they always have to put on all these, you know, confusing uh, words and whatnot just to be as specific as possible. Um, so JPA is sort of the, the standard, if you will. And Hibernate, you can think of as, um, as implementing a lot of the JPA's um, standards, but using a little bit of its own flavor uh, to do its own little song and dance, if you will, in Java. Okay, and I mean this is just it's a it's a brand, right? Hibernate is a brand. Um, I believe it was it's an open source project. So a bunch of open uh, developers got together and created this open source framework called Hibernate, and it was probably picked up and purchased by a big company, and uh, and they got a lot of money and all that good stuff. But um, the point is is that Hibernate is is very commonly used, and that's the reason why I'm teaching it. Since Hibernate is very commonly used, and it even touches a lot of the JPA stuff, the Java Persistence API, um, it's a very effective tool to use because it's widely adopted, and therefore there are lots of support articles online, so if you get stuck with a strange problem, you can always Google it, and there will more than likely be an article out there somewhere where someone has run into the same problem as you, and there's a solution for that problem, okay? So that's why we're really focusing on Hibernate and not any of the other um, handful of frameworks out there that you can use for your persistence framework to, to uh, you know, negotiate the communication between your Java code and your database. So yes, all that, to say it again, to reiterate it, in a nutshell, Hibernate is used and the persistence framework is used to help you communicate between the land of Java and the land of databases. Okay, because if you think about it all on its own, you know Java by itself and you know uh, SQL now by itself if you listen to all these episodes. But how in the heck do you make them talk to each other? Okay, that's the trick here. Now, normally people start things off um, by teaching you uh, sort of an intermediary step. Okay, um, and I'm I'm sort of skipping the intermediary step, um, and I I mean I I'm undecided as to whether or not I should continue to you know skip that step. I can give you a bit of an overview of what I'm skipping, um, and you can you know deem for yourself if if you think it's important to learn, uh, then you by all means can go off and learn it on your own, or maybe I'll touch on it in a future episode. Again, I'm undecided. Um, it's called, uh, what the heck is it called? I just lost my train of thought. Um, it is called JDBC. There we go. Whew, there's so many uh, acronyms and, and, you know, terms and abbreviations in programming. It's hard to keep them all straight. 
Uh, so JDBC, okay? Uh, and what the heck does JDBC stand for? Again, I should know this one, and I probably do if I wasn't putting myself on the spot. Um, JDBC, Java Database Connectivity, okay? Java Database Connectivity. Uh, JDBC is what you can write. It's a it's a sort of um, it's Java code that you can write um, in your obviously your Java land, your Java code to be able to connect to a database. Okay, so you can actually type in physical code um, and say, okay, you know, create the JDBC connection, load this driver, and execute this specific SQL statement. Okay, so you can do all this and you can really, it's a, it's a very easy way, a very lightweight way to uh, talk to your database. Okay, but it's not really a framework per se. It, it's not a, it doesn't allow a very flexible, object-oriented way to communicate with your databases. Okay, or your database, I should say. Um, so JDBC is something that I'm kind of glossing over. Um, JDBC is useful if you're if you're learning SQL at the very same time as Java. Um, it, it goes together nicely because you can you can type in native SQL code into JDBC, which and and that's obviously going to be a bit confusing because you're going to say, well, why can't I write native uh, SQL code in Hibernate? Which you can, but that's not the the um, the general way that people go about doing it. Okay. So in any case, JDBC is, is sort of a, a good thing to use if you are learning them sort of at the same time. But since I've broken it down into, I've already taught you a bunch about Java, I've already taught you a bunch about Spring Framework, I've already taught you a bunch about SQL on its own, and you've done hopefully the exercises and your homework, um, then it's okay to sort of gloss over JDBC for now and jump right into the good stuff, which is Hibernate. All right. So uh, there you have it. That's sort of what I'm skipping over. But again, maybe I'll come back to it. Maybe you guys will say, look, I really want to learn about JDBC because oftentimes that is what is included uh, as a requirement inside of uh, projects and stuff like that, like university projects or, or coding assignments. Um, teachers often ask you to, to program with JDBC if you're doing uh, database uh, application programming between Java and databases. So, I mean, fair enough. I'll leave it to you guys. If you guys really want to learn about that stuff, then by all means, reach out to me, uh, info at howtoprogramwithjava.com, um, and just let me know that you want to learn about that stuff on the podcast. So, having said that, let's move on into the actual stuff, which is the Hibernate stuff. All right, so then what is Hibernate? Well, like I've said, and beat this to, uh, you know, uh, a pulp here. It's all about um, being able to communicate between Java and your database effectively. Now, where Hibernate comes in as a framework is it is that it allows you to do this in a nice object-oriented manner. It allows you to integrate your existing code um, into uh, the Hibernate code almost anyway, entirely, in such a way that you can almost seamlessly go about uh, creating your objects as normal, your plain old Java objects, uh, business as usual type situation, and yet still be able to uh, communicate everything with a, your database accordingly. Okay, so it's really kind of neat. So there's essentially, you know, like any framework, there's an aspect of setting it up. Okay, so there's a an annoying, um, painful setup uh, situation or phase that you need to go through and typically you really only need to go through this setup once okay you might need to tweak it you know here and there as you're going through as you maybe you, uh, through the life cycle of your application um, as you may need additional features or something like that who knows but generally speaking you set it up once set it and forget it okay and then you can move on into, um, you know, throwing in the initial integration code for integrating uh, the Hibernate stuff into your, your existing objects. It doesn't need to be all the objects, just a few, um, which I'll explain in a second. And then you can actually write your Hibernate code in the back end, which allows you to actually physically, uh, you know, do things like query the database um, and create... Uh, you know, entries into the database. So doing the whole uh, CRUD operations, create, uh, read, update, and delete, which is, you know, obviously I've had a, a bunch of episodes of the podcast talking about CRUD specifically already. So if you haven't heard about those, you need to go back and listen to those if you don't know what CRUD is all about. So 
So basically what we're going to talk about right now is, I guess, a little bit of the setup and then maybe if we have time, uh, the other aspects of Hibernate. So basically, you know, again, this is tough to um, translate over uh, audio, but uh, basically what I did was I put together, um, I actually haven't written up the blog post yet, the show notes to go along with this. Uh, so I'm actually going to be doing that afterwards because, like I said, I didn't have enough time throughout the day. It kind of messes my whole schedule. Um, but basically, I- I've put together an example uh, application that I'm that we we are going to be working with uh, throughout the um, sort of topic of Hibernate. Okay, we're going to have one pro- project that I'm going to be referring back to, and I-, I think it came from someone that asked me if I could create an address book type uh, software. And, um, you know, I, I love that you guys send me questions. I really do. I really appreciate the questions. I love getting questions. But when it's something like, can you create an address book program for me? Or can you create a, an Android program that will, you know, interface with a database and uh, do all my taxes for me? Unfortunately, normally, the answer is going to be, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but no, I can't do that. I can't go and, and create an entire application for you and then send you all the code. Um, because more, more than likely, these are people who um, have homework assignments and, um, and they are confused about their homework assignments. So they just want someone else to come in and do it all for them. So, I mean, if you, if you feel like you're ever going to reach out to me and say, hey, Trevor, can you go ahead and create this whole entire web application for me real quick? and send it to me over email. The, unfortunately, the answer is going to be no. Um, but if your question is, hey, Trevor, I'm working on this address book uh, program for my class, and I've tried to do you know this, this, and this, and at this point, I'm stuck, and I need help with this, then by all means, yes, ask me that question because it's a specific question, and I can help you get past whatever roadblock that you're in. But yes, usually the answer for can you do the entire assignment for me, the answer is going to be no. Anyway, so, but this one person lucked out, although I'm sure they asked me this question ages ago, it's can you create an address book application for me? But in this case, the address book application um, works well. It's a good uh, example project to use uh, for um, the tutorial that I'm going to be doing or bringing you guys through for Hibernate. So anyway, having said that, let's focus back on what I was talking about, which is um, the whole configuration aspect to your uh, Hibernate stuff. So basically what I did here is I, I went to my Spring Tool Suite, which is the uh, IDE that I use. You can also use Eclipse um, or really NetBeans as well, although the NetBeans I'm not as much familiar with uh, how the projects and the wizards work. But with Spring and, and uh, the Spring IDE and uh, Eclipse, you can go and you can say, you know, file new and you can create a new uh, Spring project. Okay, Spring project is the key um, term there. And then what I did was I created a project using a template. So you can actually choose a template and there's a bunch to, cho- to choose from. But I just went to the simple projects and I, I chose the simple Spring Web Maven project. Okay, a whole bunch of words in there. Simple Spring Web Maven. Okay, you can probably axe the word simple. So it's just Spring Web Maven. And what that means is it's combining three different, uh, essentially, frameworks. One is Spring, which we talked about before, the Spring framework. The other is integrating web functionality into it, which really just means to create a web XML file. Um, I'm not sure if we touched on web XML stuff uh, previously, but that's not, that's kind of outside the scope of the Hibernate talk, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. And then there's Maven. Now, I forget if we've talked about Maven. Maven has nothing to do with um, the frameworks that, that I've been talking about, like the Spring Framework and the Hibernate Framework. Uh, Maven is actually something that's a very sort of universal um tool, I think it's more of a tool than a framework. It's a tool that allows you to uh, quickly and easily um, download and import all of the library files and all the dependencies and all the complex, um, let's call it crap, because it really is crap if you're doing it all manually. uh, It's really just a nightmare. Uh, Maven really helps to make it very easy to bring in all these frameworks together and, and make them work uh, nicely with each other. 
okay? Because if you didn't have Maven, you wouldn't be able to quickly create a spring uh, web hibernate enabled application. It just wouldn't wouldn't be easy because you'd be downloading things and tearing your hair out because you know dependencies are clashing with each other and and you're getting errors that are strange and you're you know you want to hurt yourself so <laughs> that's what maven does maven helps you to not want to hurt yourself because um it does a really good job not a perfect job but it really does a very helpful job at uh, at managing dependencies that's what it's all about um and if you ne if you don't know what that is you've never had to deal with managing dependencies before uh, but you have been using Maven, then trust me, that's a great thing because Maven, if you didn't use it, you would just be having a nightmare scenario. I know because I used to do it without Maven and it, it really just is a nightmare. In any case, I chose to use a simple spring web Maven application uh, and I chose that one for the purpose of the fa or the reason because it d doesn't already have all the Hibernate stuff embedded inside of it. Um, I wanted it to not have Hibernate stuff so that we could bring in the Hibernate stuff all on our own. So I went ahead and created that. And what that basically does is it creates a project for you. I called the project, I gave it a name of address book, which makes sense because we're creating an address book. And it allows us um, to create sort of a skeleton project okay so it brings in it creates um your your web xml file uh it creates your mvc config file um, and all these things that you're going to need as sort of a skeleton to create a web application um and, and that you can eventually plug hibernate into all right so um again these are these are fairly advanced topics and i i'm i, I can certainly get lost in the details of each of these um but again i'm going to try to focus in on hibernate and if you guys really get lost with any of the other stuff um, in, in terms of if you go and, and try to set this up yourself and you're really lost with how the web uh, XML file works for some reason or the, the the MVC config file or the application config file um, then by all means you can ask the questions and and I will address them as best as I can in, in future episodes um, but basically all those files come down to it's it's all configuration crap it's the one time uh, initial setup configure configuration stuff that you need to have in place to create your your application so we're going to be creating a web application and it's going to it's essentially going to be a, an application that you can access on the internet and uh, you'll be able to go to this address book application and you'll be able to input entries into your own address book and have it be saved to your own database because that's the whole point here you want to be able to save stuff to your own database and have it be in that database and not be deleted ever because you know it's in a database and databases are very permanent things they're meant to be saved on the file uh, system and and you know they're meant to not disappear because then if they did then that would be very very bad for business <laughs> so um, that's the whole you know scope and point of, uh, of this stuff that we're talking about today. So having said all that, um, I create that, that initial skeleton of the project and then I start to bring in uh, a few things. The first thing I actually do, <coughs> excuse me, is if, um, if you're using Spring SDS, the Spring Tool Suite, um, I, I actually right click on the address book uh, project that I've created through that wizard that we talked about. And I actually go to run as and I say Maven install. Now, what Maven install does, it runs a bunch of stuff and it downloads, it, it sort of kicks off this initial process of downloading all the files that you need uh, to be able to have your project work properly, all the dependencies and all that stuff that I said Maven is wonderful at. Um, you run the Maven install, so again, run as, sorry, sorry, right click on the address book, project, run as, Maven install. It will do all of its magic and do all of its stuff that it does to, you know, get it uh, created and get it ready to rock. And then what I do is I, I let it do its thing. And then I right click on the application again and I say refresh. Okay, I hit F5 on it. I say refresh. Um, I don't know why you need to do that, but sometimes you need to to sort of get everything back um, into where it, they, they should be. Because like I said, it downloads a bunch of files. Um, so if you if it downloads a bunch of files, then it, it might not pull them into the workspace. Uh, so you need to refresh the workspace so it knows what the heck is going on. Then once you've done that, maybe you need to do a clean and um, and build again. Who knows? But once you've done all that, you should be able to then cl left click on the address book. Um, uh, what's it called project and drag it down into your servers window. 
Okay. Um, again, if you're using the spring, uh, the STS IDE, this will make perfect sense. I don't know if the Eclipse IDE has a servers window, uh, so it might be a bit different. But basically what I'm doing is I'm deploying my web application. Okay, I'm deploying the web app. So by whatever means that you need to do that in whatever IDE you're using, that is the point of what I'm doing here. We've created a web-enabled project, and now we want to deploy the web project onto our web server. Okay, the web server I'm using um, for this, I updated my Spring Tool Suite. I think it comes built in with something called the VMware vFabric TC Server Developer Edition version 2.9. Very, very big mouthful, but all it is is TC stands for Tomcat. So it's a Tomcat server um, with a certain uh, twist that uh, that is sort of, I guess, proprietary uh, to, uh, to Spring, because Spring, I believe, is owned by VMware. Uh, but in any case, whatever. These are all, you know, unimportant details. All it is is a server that I have. It's a web server, and it does the job that I need it to do, which is to, to be able to deploy and run my web application. So I deploy it onto my server, and then with this particular one, all you can do is, um, I think you can just sort of go to your probably local host uh, port 8080, which is local host colon 8080, that's 8080, and if you go there and you run it, it and you hit enter in your web browser, um, it'll bring up your just a Tomcat or your VMware um, server saying, yep, everything's good and up and running, your server's good. Uh, but then what you do is you you uh, additionally add onto the localhost 8080 you add forward slash address book, and it's case sensitive. I put I put a capital A and a capital B for address and book. If you didn't create it with capitals, then then you need to be sure to not type in capitals. But you need to match the case of whatever it was the project you created was called, because that's the name that it's going to deploy as um, in your server. So you go to localhost 8080 forward slash address book and we hit enter and then boom you should be able to see uh, whatever welcome file that it happened to create in the wizard for that particular uh, project again I'm talking specific to uh, spring tool suite um, so if you're not using that again it definitely doesn't it's not going to work like that uh, but maybe you should want you might want to go and download spring tool suite because I like it I use it um, it works for me but again obviously it's your choice so, in any case, you run it, boom, great. We have not yet even gotten into the Hibernate stuff. So this is a web application that you have created, which is Spring-enabled, which is a web application, and it has Maven installed in it that is used to manage dependencies. So now we have a good starting point as to uh, what we need for uh, embedding our Hibernate into it. So the next thing I want to do is create the Hibernate files. Okay, so what the heck are the Hibernate files? Well, there's a couple things that you need to do. And one is, is to create your, what they call a persistence configuration file. Okay, and it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It is the configuration file that you're going to use for your persistence framework. So now what I do is, there's two ways of doing it. You can either create it as a Java file or you can create it as an XML file. Okay, when you create it as an XML file, um, that's sort of the now becoming the old school way of doing it. Um, and actually, that's still the way that I have done it with my previous applications because I've not uh, gotten used to the new way of doing it. But now I'm transitioning into the new way of doing it. So, I mean, it's it's usually there's a lag, right, with all programmers with uh, adopting these new ways of, you know, implementing and using these frameworks and everything. Um there's always a lag time, but now I'm finally catching up and I'm using the Java file. So what I've done is I've created um, a, a new package. So I've created a new package. I've called it com dot how to program a Java dot address book and then dot config. I've called it config because that's where I put my config files. So that's the package I've created. And then inside of that package, I put my persistence config Java file. Okay, so it's just a regular plain old Java file. Um, but again, it's used for uh, configuring my persistence framework, which is my Hibernate framework. Okay, so it's called persistence config. It's just a public class persistence config file. There's nothing crazy going on inside of this other than some annotations. 
All right. Hopefully you remember what annotations are. We've talked about them before. Uh, at least I hope we have. Um, they are what we use to um, sort of sprinkle in the hibernate functionality or any functionality into our existing code um, without having to type a whole lot of code. Okay. Um, it's uh, hopefully, I really hope I've explained annotations before. Um, actually, let me, let me pause this and go back and see <laughs> if I've talked about annotations before at all. Um, one second. All right, after pausing it and, and sort of going back into my blog, I see that I've mentioned it in my blog before, um, but I'm not sure if I've mentioned it on the podcast. So if you're up to date on the blog, then you already know what annotations are. Um, if you're not up to date on the blog stuff, then perhaps you're not too up to date. Uh, but annotations are, are those um, uh, pieces of code that start with an at symbol. Okay, they usually exist um, above the class definition. So when you say public class, whatever, um, you'll have an annotation above that, that that is a class level annotation um, that will say at symbol and then some sort of a word um, to denote that particular annotation. They can also exist on the uh, instance variable level. So you can annotate an instance variable. Usually we do that with something called the at auto wired annotation. That's a very common one that we put there. Um, and that is what we use in spring to wire automatically wire in uh, the, de the dependency. So if you have, if you've created like a, a service, um, like a, uh, you know, I don't know, address book service, if you have a service class, um, you can say, you know, address book service and annotate it with the at auto wired and then spring will actually inject it for us so that it, it that, you know, file or that, uh, what should I say, um, that variable is actually not null when the, um, when the web application starts, it won't be null because we've wired it in with the at auto wired annotation. Um, and these things can also, these annotations can also exist on the method level as well. Okay, so if you have an actual method itself, you can annotate it um, with, you know, whatever you want. Um, in Spring, you've seen this before. Um, in the Spring framework, we use annotations all the time for our, our controllers. Okay, we annotate the, um, the controller class itself with the at controller annotation. We use the at request mapping annotation, which allows us to say, um, you know, what, uh, what web address, um, or at least the URI of the address, the, the, the part to the right of the domain, um, we use that to denote what part or what um, controller file should be associated with what URL. Okay, so if you want, um, you know, one particular part of the application's URL to be tied in with a particular method, of our controller, then we can do that using the at request mapping annotation. So these annotations are very cool. They're very um, cool pieces of code that we can use that sort of, it's almost like um, bringing in a whole, uh, it's like bringing in a method all on its own and plugging it into another method um, by means of this annotation stuff. It brings in additional functionality uh, that you wouldn't normally have if you didn't obviously put the annotation there. So in the case of the at request mapping annotation, um, if we didn't have that in there, then that method that we create, like let's say if you go to you know localhost 8080 slash address book slash create an address book, okay, so that's the URL we type in. Um, if we didn't have the request mapping that mapped the um, you know, create an address book URL or URI, I should say, the right-hand part of the domain. Um, if we didn't have that there, uh, then that method where we actually, you know, have created a method to create an address book, um, that method wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't interact. It wouldn't fire or execute in any case uh, because we haven't mapped it with the request mapping to that URL. So when you actually go to that URL, uh, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to run because it doesn't match an existing controller. It doesn't uh, plug in with an existing controller. Whereas when we use the at request mapping, we can actually make a plug in that URL to uh, a particular method in a controller. And voila, we can make a create an address book when we go to the slash create address book uh, URL. All right. Anyway, again, that's getting a bit off topic. That's talking about annotations. But uh, I mean, the exact same thing applies to Hibernate. So when we are creating our, I was talking about the persistence config Java file. Again, this is the persistent, this is the file that we use 
to uh, um, outline all of our configuration stuff, okay, our setup stuff for Hibernate. When we're creating our public class persistence config file, we annotate it with a bunch of stuff, okay? One is um, this annotation called at configuration. Another one is called at enable transaction management. Um, another one I use is property source and component scan. Um, a bunch of annotations, which, you know, obviously when you hit get hit with them all at once, they seem very strange and very um, uh, intimidating, but these ones aren't too intimidating. I mean, you can even get away with not even understanding any of them and just sort of copy pasting the code and working with it. Um, but I'm going to be getting into, you know, these things in much more detail as we go through all these episodes, because it's nice to know what all these things actually do. But for now, let's, let's be... Um, let's be a little bit more close-minded in the sense that we're just going to sort of copy paste it in here and, and understand this from a sort of a, you know, whatever 50,000 foot view uh, of this whole uh, hibernate uh, persistence framework thing. Okay. So we create this persistence config class. We annotate it with all that stuff that I just talked about and, uh, and we start creating our beans and, and beans um, are what we use to, uh, you know, breathe life into our um, our application with respect to configuring Hibernate. Okay, so one one bean that we're going to create is a session factory. Okay, this session factory bean um, we're going to create is going to uh, be what we use time and time again when we want to interact with our database. When we want to say, hey, I want to select something from my database, or I want to update. Uh, an existing record in my database, or I want to delete something from the database, or I want to add something to the database, okay? Um, the session factory is what we will be using every single time. We're going to be opening up a transaction and creating a session to actually uh, communicate with the database and say, run this select statement inside of this particular session, okay? So we're going to be using the session factory to get our sessions each and every single time. So that's going to be a bean that we're going to create. We're going to actually go about uh, setting up a session factory, which for this particular implementation is called a local session factory bean. We're going to create a new local session factory bean, and we're going to configure it with a data source, because obviously since I've been saying you need to connect or you use that to connect to a database, it's going to need something called a data source, which is the source for it to connect to an actual database, right? And when we create that, that database, that, that data source, um, we're actually going to create it with an object called a basic data source object. So all this stuff is very object oriented, right? We have a basic uh, data source object, and then we're, it, that's going to have properties, and we're going to assign properties to it like the driver um, that it wants to use, okay? Because again, the driver here um, is um, that there's a bunch of different drivers you can use with respect to whichever uh, actual implementation of a database you're using. So if you're using MySQL or uh, Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle or PostgreSQL, all these are different flavors of databases. Um, the data, the, the driver class is what you use to decide which one you're actually going to be connecting to. So in this case, we're going to be creating um, a driver class that connects with uh, MySQL. Okay, there's an actual driver to create to connect with MySQL. Um, it's again, it's one of those stupid little one-time annoying setup things that you just need to do once, and and once it works, then it works, um, and it should hopefully work forever. Okay, fingers crossed. Um, the next thing you do for this particular data source is to set a URL. Okay, you need to say what is the URL that that it will use to connect to this database. All right. And usually it's on the local host. Okay, we use local host um, all the time when we're in our development environment. That just means look on my computer, on my own um, computer that I'm using right now, um, you know, in front of my face. Uh, connect to that computer and look for the database on that computer because that's where we've installed our database server, right? We've installed our MySQL uh, database server on our own computer. So we're just using the code to connect to our own computer. And how we do that is by telling it to connect to local host. In a real world, um, you know, live application environment where you have, you know, let's say Facebook and you're going to facebook.com, um, obviously their, their database is probably not located at localhost for them. It's probably located at some IP address, um, 
which connects to you know a, a data warehouse that they have where they have a whole bunch of computers running all the same time with tons and tons of hard drive space. Um, so you know that's that's where they're going to be pointing their URL to. But for us, we're thinking small, we're thinking local. Um, so we're just going to connect to our own computers to look for the database. And then we need to set the, the username and the password for the data source because it needs to connect to the, the database using a username and password for security reasons, right? You don't want to just have a database that's wide open for anyone to go in and, and mess around with. That would be a very huge security problem. So there's a database uh, password and username that we need to set as well. But again, all this is in an object-oriented um, uh, light. It's an object-oriented fashion. It's an object-oriented everything that we use to create our configuration stuff, which is neat. I like it. Um, so that's our database, uh, or data source, I should say. And again, that ties into uh, the session factory. The session factory is what we're going to be using and pinging every time we want to talk to our database. All right. The next thing that we want to do for the session factory is to have it scan uh, certain packages for uh, pertinent information. All right. So this is a part of the framework that it needs to, you need to just kind of point it in the direction and say, okay, all of the persistence type stuff is going to be in this particular Java package. Okay. Hopefully you remember what a Java package is. It's the, uh, where we, what we use is like the file structure to organize all of our files. Um, mine was com dot how to program a Java dot address book. And then I have a dot persistence is a package I've created where I'm going to be putting all my crap, uh, with respect to hibernate. So that's where I'm going to, I'm going to set that to scan that package when it's, you know, looking for hibernate type stuff. And then for our session factory, again, we want to set uh, hibernate properties because there's a bunch of properties that go um, sort of hand in hand with hibernate. Um, and these, I don't want to get into too much. These are just, um, you can really copy paste these things and, um, and sort of leave it alone for the time being until you start to get more comfortable with hibernate and then you want to get more fancy with it. So from a beginner's perspective, you just kind of want to copy paste the properties um, and, and just put them in there. And I, I, sh I'm, I should have said way back before I started talking about all this stuff, I'm absolutely going to include all of my source code um, in the, the show notes. So you can go to how to program with java.com forward slash session 50 five zero. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see my source code. It's going to be a lot of source code this time around, and I'm going to have to spend a lot of time putting this these show notes together, um, but it'll be worth it, and you'll be able to copy-paste and get this up and, and running yourself, uh, hopefully without problems. All right. So, I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes along this per particular persistence configuration file. Um, there's something called a transaction manager, um, transactions are something that we're going to be talking about for sure in our Hibernate talk. Um, definitely not in this episode because transaction management can probably take a few episodes all on its own. Um, so obviously, having said that, I'm not going to get into details about the transaction manager. But you, what you need to know is, excuse me, you need to have a transaction manager defined in order to actually have Hibernate work and, uh, and connect to your database properly. Okay, so uh, that's just, again, that's a copy paste. You can copy paste the Hibernate uh, transaction manager code, which is really just, what, four lines of code here, three lines of code. Um, it's actually not too much code, but there's a lot behind it. There's a, a lot of meaning behind what transaction manager does. Um, and that's what I'm obviously not going to talk about today, but I will be in the future. And then um, there's actually another one I have in here in the transaction uh, per or persistence config file that I actually didn't even get time to look into. It's something called a persistence exception translation post processor. Good Lord, that's a long name. <laughs> persistence exception translation post processor. It sounds like, anyway, whatever. It sounds like some mad scientist, mad scientist stuff. Um, if I were to read the help file here, it says it's a bean post processor that automatically ap applies persistence exception translation to any bean marked with springs repository annotation, adding a corresponding persistence exception translation advisor to the exposed proxy. Oh my God. It's just, you know, on and on and on with this programming talk. Um, what it sounds like is 
it, uh, it's a, a means by which to use exceptions that the database throws and, and translate it into something that makes a bit more sense for programmers. I think that's what it does. That's literally the first I'm looking into it right now. Um, so uh, again, with, when we're talking about exceptions at this point, um, that's getting more advanced into our, I suppose, future talks with respect to Hibernate. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in those details right now. What I do want to get bogged down with is the fact that this is annoying this first uh, step that we need to take to configure our Hibernate environment to work with our uh, code. Okay, so it's a necessary evil. We copy paste and uh, and set up some some property files and, and we're good to go. Okay, so that's the persistence config file. I'm done talking about the persistence config file. I know it's a bit confusing, but uh, again, it's a necessary evil. So what else do we have? Well, there's the properties file that we need to be able to create uh, along with um, our, our, our Hibernate stuff. Okay, so you'll see in the code um, it, it makes reference to um, this environment uh, variable, this um, environment, uh, what's it called? Um, not session variable. My brain is not working. It is an instance variable. There we go. Um, it, it, this environment uh, instance variable, it says it's an interface for representing the environment in which the current application is running. Um, this is sort of a, a newer um, piece of code that I've heard about that you can use to um, sort of switch your environments around. So if you have a development environment as well as a uh, QA environment and a production environment, these are all different environments that can be running simultaneously um, and that are needed to uh, create a um, an actual life cycle of the entire application development uh, creation process. So if you are... Um, uh, creating an application as part of a large team in an organization like Microsoft or something like that. Um, you're likely going to have a development environment. Well, you're going to have your own local computer environment. Sometimes you have a development environment that people share. Then you'll have a quality assurance environment, which is where um, the code will slowly trickle up, right? You have code that you're putting in your own local computer, and then you check in your code into perhaps a development environment, and this development environment is shared by all the developers, and it usually um, is a continually, you know, it, it's automatically built all the time. It's always restarting itself and rebuilding itself, and, um, and it's sort of the first line of defense against catching bugs and problems. And then if all goes well, you, you take from the, um, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is going, you take from the development environment and move it into the QA environment. And then you move it into maybe another environment before production, which is live on the internet. Um, so in any case, the point is you have this environment uh, variable that you can use to um, specifically tailor uh, this code to whatever environment you're working with. All right. Whew. So in this particular case, we have a properties file. And the properties file is, is set up in such a way that it is our own local environment our own local computer environment. So this is where you actually specify your driver name, you specify your actual um, uh, connection URL to your database, your actual username and password, and all that good stuff. This is all uh, put into a persistence uh, properties file, okay? And you'll see where I store this. I put this in my uh, resources folder. Um, and then then your um, environment, uh, your persistence config file will be able to talk to your persistence properties file, okay? Persistence config Java file, persistence properties um, text file, okay? That's, that's what those two um, are in terms of actual files and file extensions. So, whew. Then what do you do? Well, that's sort of your initial setup stuff. And let me just check and see how long I've been talking for. Jeez, it's almost been an hour already. So you're probably, your, your brain is probably spinning at this point, And it seems as though I haven't even gotten past the, uh, the part which I figured I wouldn't get past, which is just the initial setup portion of it. But trust me, I mean, once you can get this setup done, it's, it's a set it and forget it situation. So um, you can learn from it. It's going to be painful. I promise you it's going to be painful. Um, but I also promise you that once you can do it once, then you can copy paste it into, um, you know, future applications and, and make use of that code as well. So it's your, your future proofing yourself. This is, you're putting, um, uh, you know, 
drops in the bucket that are going to be able to be used uh, time and time again in, in projects uh, far beyond the one that, you, that you're working on right now. Okay, so it's, it's very useful stuff to do is what I'm getting at. So I, I guess that's where we can sort of draw the line and say, okay, let's, let's stop the talk there. We've talked about the persistence config and, um, and we've talked about Maven a little bit, which is what we use to manage our dependencies. Um, and, uh, you know, in the, um, I'm not even sure if we're going to be able to, you know, given what I've talked about right now, if we're going to be able to actually run this, uh, web application. I'm wondering if there's going to be any problems with it if all we have is just the configuration stuff. Well, maybe we, maybe we will. I think we might be able to run it with just the persistent stuff set up and not actually have any of the um, actual database accessing code typed in. Um, I think we'll be able to run it without it. Who knows? We'll see by the time I actually write this up. Um, likely tomorrow because now it's you know past 9 p.m. my local time. Um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, put this all together into a nice, neat package for you. Again, on the show notes page, which is how to program with java.com forward slash session 50, five zero, and you'll be able to access all of this code and, and be able to put um, the code, uh, put it into your visual, you know, cortex as opposed to your audio, you know, cortex, clearly not real, um, uh, health words or whatever. I've been watching too much house lately. Um, so I think that is a good place to stop. And, uh, in the next episode, like I said, we're going to be talking about how to pull together this whole confusing configuration stuff into, uh, something that's useful to be able to make use of our session factory, which I said is sort of the, um, a key aspect of being able to, to communicate with our database. We're going to be able to communicate with the session factory and actually start to do things like um, interacting with our database, creating you know records in the database and deleting from it and, and, and selecting from it and updating and all that good stuff. Um, I might not be able to hit all four of the CRUD operations, um, but I should hopefully be able to get to the creation and the, uh, the reading. So the, the C and the R of CRUD uh, we should be able to hit and tackle in the next episode. So you'll see how to do that. Again, it's all in Java code, which is kind of nice. I'm not, we're actually not talking about, you know, too many XML files here. We're just talking about the land of Java and maybe one properties file, which is really just a text file, which is pretty straightforward uh, to understand. So, <laughs> phew, thank, thankfully that um, can be done like that. And I can hopefully teach it to you in plain English. Um, hopefully I haven't confused you already. If you have questions, please, please, please email me um, and I will address them in the future episodes. Again, info at howtoprogramwithjava.com. But everything that you need for this particular episode is going to be at howtoprogramwithjava.com forward slash session 50. Uh, be there or be square. Does that sound good? Sounds good. So I guess to wrap up this episode, um, I will urge you to um, sign up for my mailing list, which is going to be in that um, particular um, link that you're going to go to. Again, how to program a java.com forward slash session 50. Go there, scroll up, or at least you'll see at the very top, you'll be able to sign up for a mailing list, whether it's going to be for a, 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 um, a workshop, a live online workshop that I'm going to be putting on, or if it's just to get on the, my mailing list, um, it's very, very valuable stuff that you're going to get from the mailing list. Okay, I'm going to send you um, everything you need to know with respect to Java. Um, I even send you um, uh, an ebook or not an ebook, a, um, a one page PDF that is an outline of all the tools that I use. So you can actually get on there, see all the tools that I use, um, download them for yourself because it's very, very, very useful. Uh, every single one of those tools uh, to get to know them and to download them and sign up for them and use them. Um, because there's, there, those are the things that Java professionals use every single day. That's what you get for free when you sign up to my mailing list. And I only send you good stuff. I don't send you junk mail. Um, and now with this new law that's passed, at least in Canada, I don't know if you've heard of it. Probably not if you don't live in Canada. Uh, we're getting really strict in Canada with our spam laws. So I really i am I'm shackled down. I have to send you only you know pure, awesome, and valuable content. And that's what I will do and I promise to do. Um, so that you can learn the Java programming language 
and not just Java programming, but really you could take these concepts and apply it to any programming language. So hop on the mailing list. You'll see at the very top of the page, you'll be able to uh, punch in your, your email address and sign up for it. It's great stuff. I promise you, you will love it. Plus you get to talk to me directly. If you ever want to respond to one of the emails and just say, Hey, uh, people do that all the time and I love it. So if anything else, you know, just do it, sign up just to talk to me personally um, and, and say hi because I'd love to say hi back and get to know um, the person behind this microphone that I'm talking to. All right. Excellent stuff. Let's call it a day. Thanks so much for sticking up uh, and listening to me <laughs> for, uh, you know, an hour now, just past the hour mark. So um, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your um, your in intent for listening and wanting to learn the Java programming language. I think it's going to pay off big time for you in your journey to become a programmer. So best of luck. Um, all my, my, my very best wishes to you and, and maybe to your family. If you have one, say hi to them for me. Um, if you're listening with, you know, your family or your kids right now, um, hello to you and your kids. Give your kids a high five for me. Um, hopefully they're going to grow up to be uh, big, strong programmers um, just like yours truly. And I look forward to seeing you slash talking to you in the next episode, which will be session 51. Take care of yourselves. Happy learning. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the How to Program with Java podcast. Please visit howtoprogramwithjava.com for more useful Java tutorials. 